at some point along the line, of course, I, I had uh, this very interesting client who um, is ex-Special uh, Forces, and after he left the military, he got into law enforcement. And I consider him, you know, one of those stereotypical American heroes. He's a tall, you know, well-built, looks has that heroic-looking physique. Um, he knows his own mind. He, he puts his life on the line for what he believes in. And he started talking to me about the Second Amendment, which at that time I didn't think was very important. In fact, I remember, um, you know, joking with some of my other clients about, you know, these stupid gun nuts, if they you know, if they want to support the Second Amendment, then they should have the right to own all the uh, muzzle-loading flintlock rifles that they want, which is the cutting-edge technology uh, at the time of the Revolution. Um, you know, you had to pour in the powder, pour in the, you know, put in the in the in the ball and pack it down, and um, you know, and we just thought it was funny to to think about all these people trying to be in a gunfight and say, "Oh, wait a minute, wait," you know, I got pour in the powder and pack in the ball and and then uh, get the musket ready to fire. And, um, so I, I thought that was funny. Um, and he started talking to me about the Second Amendment and he started talking about s some of the underlying principles and he said, well, so you think gun control is good? Well, um, you know, in Britain and Australia they have instituted gun bans and violent crimes gone up. Well, at first it didn't quite get through to me, so I kind of ignored it, but he would repeat things like that and finally it got through a little bit. And he said some other stuff and so I, I finally decided, okay, I'll do some research. Um, when I was in college, I loved to do research. I loved to go to the library, um, get out all the original reports,